So I'm Ingrid Ellen, and uh, <laughs> Sean knows me, from, from NYU. And, um, and Sean, you spent, and this is a great discussion, but you mostly focused on your work in federal policy. And I think you have a lot to be proud of for the work that you did as Commissioner of Housing in New York. And whatever ends up happening with the budget, it's pretty clear that local governments are going to feel increasing pressure to step up to the plate on housing. And I'm wondering sort of what lessons you could share from your experience in New York, a city that has for decades now invested far more than any other city in affordable housing. And, and sort of what, what can other cities learn? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, they should get a hold of your research. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll talk about that. But I think there, there has been this movement over uh, a number of decades that I think you will see accelerate um, to find local ways to invest in housing. And um, again, not, I don't want to scoop anything you may be talking about, but I think there's pretty good evidence that these kinds of investments done in the right way not only have huge impacts on neighborhoods and people's lives, but actually pay for themselves. Because if you get momentum in revitalizing neighborhoods, the property tax revenues that you get off of that um, can pay for themselves in the, in the long run. And that's a, it's a powerful argument that I think um, many mayors and, and other local policymakers are, are understanding. I think the other big thing um, to understand, and this, this goes to the point earlier about you know, lots of the fights and the conflicts that I see are happening at the local level. Um, in, in many ways, you know, they say location, location, location. Land use is king in housing policy um, you know, planning issues. And that's all local, right? Um, we tried, I think you'll probably, th this is another area where you, you've got agreement across the aisle. You know, we have too many regulatory barriers to housing. And we ought to be building more. We ought to be finding ways to encourage localities to be building more. But the, you know, large lot zoning, uh, local NIMBY resistance to density and you know a lot of this is is race and class fears covered over by language about um, you know we're worried about losing our property values and other uh, other things there is a huge need to really move local policies toward allowing more housing to be built but also there are really innovative strategies that use zoning power that use government creates value by creating zoning right and a lot of what we tried to do in new york um, was to use that value that was created to put towards public benefits affordable housing but also parks and other things and done right what's what's really powerful about it is is generally those neighborhoods well where the land is worth the most where giving that extra floor of, of zoning or extra five floors of zoning is worth the most, also tend to be the neighborhoods that have the best schools, the best access to jobs. And so if you can figure out how to use where the land is most valuable to create affordable housing, you're also building in the opportunity for housing in a place where we now know from you know the really interesting research that's coming to light that it will make a huge difference in the future lives of those kids that are growing up in those in those neighborhoods as well so i think that's a it's a really important thing but i just one quick personal story my very first community meeting i did as as housing commissioner in new york we were trying to rezone the waterfront in in brooklyn greenpoint and williamsburg so this is this was formerly the most active industrial waterfront in the world, right? Had the largest rope manufacturing plant. It had Domino Sugar, the largest. It was only one factory operating in this two miles of waterfront. 
And here, you know, I'd go into a community meeting. We're going to bring new housing and parks. And it was brutal, right? My, my deputy commissioner, he did the second meeting. He had to be protected by police at this thing. Part of me felt like saying, you live in New York City, for God's sake. You don't like tall buildings? Like, really? But the, the power of resistance to, and, and again, this goes to my, like, the, I think the, the story that is most visible is people going to meetings saying, we don't want this in our neighborhood, right? The question is, how do you tell the story of the kid who's going to live in that building and go to a better school but isn't even born yet, right? And um, those, to me, are some of the most interesting and powerful policy decisions that have to be made that really affect lives but also are, are hard to write. Hi, uh, Tanzina Vega, CNN, um, NYCHA resident for 20 years, yeah. made it, I guess, I don't know. Um, two questions for you. One is about NYCHA's budget, uh, which obviously with, with the budget that was released today um, is about to take a hit, and they're already $17 billion in the hole, I believe, in their operating budget. So for public housing nationally, but also specific to New York, which has the largest public housing stock, I mean, What's the solution here? I know we've heard lots of private, uh, private public partnerships and RAD and, and things like that, but there are lots of concerns among uh, residents that that could just be the privatization of ultimately public housing. So how do you see that um, and concerning those, the concerns of residents there? Yeah. Well, look, the, the answer is public housing needs more resources. Uh, it's, it's not complicated. Um, and you know this is where you know my blood starts to boil to hear the new budget director to say like oh yeah there's plenty of stuff to cut the what what's insidious about this is not just the direct the cuts to the operating and the capital fund for public housing but the cuts that have been deepest and for obvious reasons are to the funds that public housing authorities get to run public housing. And so what does this mean? It means they're cutting maintenance staff, right? It means that what we now know that, because public housing authorities run the voucher program as well, we know that if housing authorities do a good job helping families that want to move, move into communities of opportunity, there are huge long-term benefits for those kids. I mean, like, the difference between the lowest opportunity and the highest opportunity communities, you're talking about boys earning up to 50% more over their lifetimes. Like, wonks like us who studied housing, the idea that you could get a 50% difference in lifetime earnings is like nirvana, right? So we know that these impact. But no housing authority is going to be able to implement those programs. Family self-sufficiency, all kinds of other things that really help families succeed. There's going to be no budget for them to be able to just the day-to-day -day management of public housing, much less try to do the things that uh, go the extra mile to help uh, families succeed. So I, I think it's, it's brutal. Um, and it's already, uh, public housing has been uh, one of the hardest hit areas already in the HUD, HUD budget. So the, something that I started that I think has some bipartisan support is an effort to try to bring more public-private partnerships to public housing. And um, this is not the privatization of public housing. This is... Every single unit of affordable housing we build today in the United States of America has a public-private partnership, right? We use the low-income housing tax credit. We use debt. We, this is just allowing public housing authorities to do exact what every other owner of housing in the country gets to do, which is access all the tools that we have for affordable housing. And I'm not saying it's every, it's, you know, the answer for every single housing authority. I'm saying at least in a world where their, their funding is getting cut, at least let them access these other tools. 
And in fact, there's been billions of dollars over the last few years through this effort called RAD that has brought, uh, brought money to, to make uh, public housing better, uh, to renovate it, to make people's lives better around, around the country. The other just broader point I would make is one of the fundamental problems here is that the constituency for public housing is small. Public housing residents care about it. Public housing authorities care about it. But because it's ba public housing is basically a, a system unto itself, right? The owned, operated, financed all by the public sector, that makes it hard. One of the reasons why I like these public-private partnerships in public housing is, you know, you walk down, the, you walk past a public housing development in New York, you don't really see stores on the ground floor, generally, right? You don't, you don't see the kind of mix of things that make a neighbor. That's because it's really hard to do with public housing. All the deeds of trust and all this complicated stuff that structures the ownership of public housing makes it really hard to integrate other uses into, into public housing. There are heroic efforts to get it done, but part of what RAD does is just make it easier to, to bring those other. So, but part of what bringing in those public-private partnerships is you start to create other stakeholders for public housing as well. Why is it that the Section 8 program and the low-income housing tax credit haven't been cut as deeply as public housing? Because there's more of a political constituency for it. And so one of, the, one of the benefits, I think, of opening public housing to these partnerships is you will start to have other folks who have a vested interest in protecting the funding for public housing as well, which in my book, you know, that may be bad for some people who want to cut the funding. In my view, it both helps preserve the housing, most importantly, but also in the longer run creates a political, a broader kind of political tent to support that. As well. And the second part of that was just to ask, in, in, as New York City is sort of developing these buildings where there's a certain amount uh, dedicated to affordable housing, that's often for the lowest income, often like the 8020s and other types of programs. What about New Yorkers that aren't in the lowest, lowest, lowest echelons of income and aren't making a million dollars a year? What about the rest of us who are just working and buying our Metro cards and doing what we have to do and still can't afford? Um, the rents, i.e., in the Lower East Side, where I grew up, I mean, I you know, yeah. can't afford to rent in my own neighborhood. So, um, and this goes a little bit to Ingrid's point, New York City and New York State, more broadly, actually have a very long-term, proud history of doing middle-income housing. And the, uh, you know, I, I still remember having a meeting, when I was housing commissioner in New York City, having a meeting on Capitol Hill where I told, I made the mistake of telling uh, some of the elected officials at the meeting that we subsidized families up to $150,000 a year of income. <laughs> they were like, what? Are you kidding me? And you know, this goes a little was bit. Was that way? Was that all they said? <laughs> a little more colorful? It was a little more colorful. Um, this is part of what's so interesting about housing is, you know, there's, there is no national housing market, right? Um, I, I always remember that in one of my favorite classes at the Kennedy School, um, it was on drug policy. The professor started the first day by saying, what's different? Because the assumption is, you know, that you're sort of basing a lot of the learning at the Kennedy School in, you know, the, the markets for goods, and is there a market failure, and you know, why should the government intervene? He, he asked a simple question, which was, why, are, why is the market for drugs different than blue jeans? Right? And so if you ask the same question about housing, what makes it so interesting, like, first of all, your blue jeans you can wear anywhere you want, right? Housing, you can't. It's you know, sort of dumb, but it is where it is. You can't move it. And that means that, by definition, you get a variation in housing that is different in every place. This is part of why I think there's housing on the national radar screen has sort of dropped away as an issue. If you, if you go back, we were talking about this earlier, if you go back to 
Jacob Rees and the tenements of the Lower East Side and, you know, 15 immigrants living in one room on the Lower East Side. The health problems were devastating, right? Housing quality was, and, and, and the conditions were terrible. Housing quality was the issue, right? Today, actually, it's a relatively small share of people in the country where the quality of their housing is their big housing problem. Overwhelmingly, it's an affordability challenge. And so it's a harder story to tell in some ways. The symptoms of that are often bad health or, you know, hunger or, so, so the, the symptoms seem like a story that's about something else, but the core, this was your point about the book, right? The core is a, is a housing problem. So there are lots of different ways that the problems of housing can manifest themselves when it's really an affordability crisis. And, and also, they vary so much from, from place to place. And um, New York, this middle income problem is a problem that seems like a a foreign country to, to, to many people, although we're seeing you know, in San Francisco and a bunch of other places similar problems. And, and New York actually does have a history of investing. Um, the Housing Development Corporation, I, mean, I, I, could, I could start to get into more, more details if you're, if you're interested about, but there is a lot in New York that does meet the needs of those families. And I think you're seeing increasingly lots of local efforts that try to take funding to to mix a, a different range. And, and often these zoning programs that I talked about are powerful tools to try to get to moderate income folks as well as the very lowest income. Federal resources are concentrated for the very lowest income. And I think that's, that's right. I, I think that makes sense because that's where the biggest need is. Um, yeah. uh, thank you so much, Sean Levin. Um, I'm Abby. I'm with City Limits in New York. Um, uh, sort of one sort of city. An avid, I used to be an avid reader. Oh, really? Before, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, one city and one more national question, which is, um, you know, like just now when we're talking about uh, Mayor de Blasio's rezoning plans, um, I think uh, a lot of people, even, even sometimes the de Blasio administration sort of talks about the rezonings of the Bloomberg, uh, of the Bloomberg years as having um, well, I won't say the de Blasio administration will say this, but a lot of a lot of people say that those rezonings, um, like the rezoning of Williamsburg, um, themselves caused uh, displacement by bringing in market rate housing to a neighborhood. And so I'm just curious how you'd res how you'd respond to that uh, that that analysis of that time. And, and the other question was, like, given that as you were saying, like federal resources like Section Eight are so important for reaching for helping the uh, most low-income people afford their housing. Um, does it make sense to you, in a, in a sort of political strategy way, for uh, for uh, for for Democrats, for people who um, want to see that budget grow, to be kind of advocating for like ridiculously high amounts of those things, kind of the same way that maybe people who want to cut those things are are advocating for ridiculously huge cuts, sort of as a political strategy. So that, those are my questions. So okay. Let me let me take the the first one in particular. Um, I don't I don't put a lot of stock in the idea that rezoning and building more housing causes gentrification. It's a it's a sort of popular uh, notion. I think you hear it a lot, but if you really look at you know, think about neighborhoods in New York like the Lower East Side, or you know, think about neighborhoods in Boston that have gentrified, where nothing has been rezoned. the The housing stock hasn't changed except to be renovated. I think about, you know, there are lots of neighborhoods in in Brooklyn and a range of other places, and I just don't. You know, Ingrid and some others who who study neighborhoods a lot could, I think, put. More, more data on it, but I think generally speaking, the, and, and you see this some now in New York, you know, um, and a little editorial from me on, on the way this has been covered, you know, the New York Times saying, you know, this isn't exactly the headline, but like, crisis in Brooklyn 
high-end rents dropping because so much housing is being built, right? <laughs> That's the point, guys. Zone, more supply, build a lot of housing, and actually, <coughs> you can have an impact by, by driving down rents. I think the other, the other point I would make on this is I think gentrification is a really interesting thing to cover. And this goes back to my earlier point of often it's the thing that you don't see that's the story. So, and Ingrid will correct me if I, if I get this wrong, but it was a really interesting study in New York City of gentrifying neighborhoods that showed that low-income people stay longer in gentrifying neighborhoods than they do in neighborhoods that aren't gentrifying. How is that possible, right? The model we all have of gentrification is the, the low-income families that are living there get pushed out, and that's what gentrification is, right? Gentrification is when low-income people stop moving into neighborhoods, right? It, people move a lot. Renters in particular move a lot. And so neighborhoods are always turning over. And the process of gentrification, and, and this is a New York case. I don't want to generalize. Ingrid could tell you about the, the country. But generally speaking, what really drives gentrification is that low-income people can no longer move into the neighborhood. But it's really hard to cover, the to find the family who can't move into a neighborhood, right? Um, and so that, but that leads to very different policy outcomes. My view was, my first question Mike Bloomberg asked me in my interview to be housing commissioner was what should I do about gentrification? And I said, first of all, it's a good problem to have because what it means is you have economic success, right? You have, because the opposite is what New York had for decades, which is everyone leaving, right? And so the question is, how do you harness that, but create opportunities for low-income people, not just to stay in neighborhoods, but low-income people to be able to continue to move in? So my view of these zoning opportunities is if you can build permanently affordable housing in the new buildings and lock those in, you're actually creating the ability for low-income people to stay in a neighborhood where, based on the research in New York, they do stay longer. That, that tells me, for some reason, they like some of the positive things that are happening in that, in that community. That if you create an opportunity for permanently affordable housing, and you build more of it, and you also preserve the existing affordable housing, you have the potential to lock in a mixed income neighborhood over a long period of, of time. right? And that's why I thought it's not just about uh, the potential for new development to cause gentrification, the new development could actually be the tool to lock in the opportunity for low-income people to live in that neighborhood over a long period of time and actually avoid gentrification. And so, th now that's controversial because the perceptions of, of gentrification are just so, but that's, that's my point about really needing to understand the dynamics and, and the phenomena that you can't see, right, that aren't obvious that contribute to the dynamics of what's happening in neighborhoods. Um, one more question, but I want it to be, I heart New York, but from a non-New Yorker about a non-New York <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question, Henry Grabar from Slate. Um, I have a question about, you talked about NIMBYism, um, and, I want, and, and the home ownership rate, and the benefits of home ownership. And I wanted to ask more broadly what you think of the declining home ownership rate, and also, which seems, what seems to me to be a central factor in NIMBYism, which is the American fixation on the home as the central vehicle of wealth creation. And if that's working, if that's a system that we should try and maintain, or if that has produced some of the problems that are so evident, not just in the high cost cities, but in places like um, Dallas and Houston, where housing is relatively low cost, but you have this tremendous level of economic segregation, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, really good series of questions that we could take a long time to, to answer. I, I think I'm not one of those people who thinks, you know, we ought to, like, 
the American dream of home ownership is a terrible thing, and we ought to like get rid of it. I think we are spending too much money in the wrong ways to to try to create home ownership that isn't really creating home ownership and helping people buy. Um, I also think you have to separate out ownership from development patterns, right? We have a huge number of condos that are now sprouting up in, in places. And, and to me, the bigger challenges are, are really about um, the single family home model, not home ownership itself. And so my view is we ought to be doing more to try to encourage mixed typologies of housing, more density. I think it is a, a, a huge problem. The, and, and a lot of the nimbyism, we think about it as home ownership, but a lot of it is just for low density, right? We don't want tall buildings. We don't want more kids in our neighborhoods or more, you know, uh, more families coming in that are going to tax our school system, et, et cetera. Um, I think those types of challenges aren't, to me, so much about home ownership. There's a separate set of questions about, which I didn't think you were getting to, about our mortgage system and, and, and all of that. Um, but I do think we have a serious, serious problem on the resistance to development and having the ability to, to build denser, particularly in the right places around transit and, and other things. And those are, in some ways, I don't know if I would say the biggest, but they're certainly one of the biggest uh, problems that contributes to our uh, affordability crisis that we have in an increasing number of, of places. That's a, you know, that's a short answer to what I think could be a, a longer discussion. But to me, that's, that's where I would focus my energies rather than on home ownership per se. So we, uh, we're, we're, we're out of time here. But I wanted to just, if I could, um, close with one thing. Um, so I think it was Politico that floated your name in a story last year about as a potential um, mayoral candidate uh, in New York. And time's <laughs> a ticking, my friend, because um, the primaries in September, elections in November, I believe there was a um, financial uh, filing deadline that was yesterday, perhaps. And I didn't notice your name on any of those. But um, so, you've done your research. <laughs> so, so just a long time city hall reporter. So, as, so uh, I'm assuming, though you can correct us, um, that you're maybe not running this time. Um, but um, perhaps it is an interest. Uh, you say you're happily unaffiliated at the moment. Mm -hmm. He says he's taking um, one vacation for every year he worked in the Obama administration, and he's not quite done yet. Um, I'm only three into the <laughs> So, um, but presuming those end at some point, um, does, does holding public office hold any interest for you? And uh, what I wanted, um, and, and I'm asking that in the context of you've, um, you've worked for a man who's held that job, Mayor Bloomberg, um, and you've worked for President Obama, so two um, very... Yeah, Andrew Cuomo. And Cuomo, so um, we've had some very, you've worked with some very storied leaders. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, just, um, if you were to hold public office, what's, what's sort of, what's one lesson you learned from Bloomberg and one you learned from um, President Obama that, uh, about leadership um, that you would uh, hope to bring to that, to, to that job or any job? So... First, let me just uh, thank you for doing this, and thank you for your dedication to, uh, to journalism. Um, this is, is running. <laughs> no. <laughs> this, this, is a measure, this is a measure of how hard your jobs are. Um, this is where that political story came from. There's a political consultant in New York who uh, let's just say dislikes de Blasio, never spoke to me, never had a single conversation with me, but was floating my name to reporters all over town and got a couple of them to bite on the story. And, and my point is, 
you got a lot of people out trying to play you <laughs> in a range of places in a, on a range of different issues. And I have a lot of respect for how hard your, your jobs are, uh, given how much, uh, how much focus there is on getting a good story. I, I think I said to you earlier, this is only at Harvard would you make this, this leap. But um, there's something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in, in physics, where it basically says by measuring something, you change it. And so you're always uncertain about whether the thing that you're observing is actually true, because by a, trying to observe it, you may have changed it. Well, you all have the impact on all of us in the policymaking world that when you observe us, you change our behavior. And uh, it's, a, it's a tricky job, and it's a tricky dance that we, that we do. Um, I am totally addicted to public service, whether that means that I will hold an elected office at some point. I'm, I have no idea at this point whether that's something I would do. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, but it also uh, terrifies me in a lot of ways. So uh, we'll see. And it's a long way off. But um, lessons that I've learned. Um, one I would from say Mike, on one Bloomberg. Um, the and this, this actually ties to what you all do. There is, I, I remember Mike saying to me, you know what the problem with the government is? I take a guy, because it was probably a guy at Bloomberg LP, who is a rock star at my company. Three out of 10 things that they try are home runs. That's a person I promote. And most importantly, I take money away from the seven things that are failing, and I put them towards the three things that are working. I take that exact same person, and I put them in the Bloomberg administration. They probably get fired because one of the seven things that goes wrong ends up on the front page of the New York Post. And most importantly, I take money away from the three things that are working because the seven things that aren't are disasters, and they have to be fixed. And that's a very private sector way of seeing the world, right? If one of those seven disasters is the child welfare system, of course it has to be fixed, right? But there is a fundamental truth in what Mike said, which is that risk taking in the public sector is really, really hard. All of the incentives are against not taking risks. So a huge part of what I see my job as, as a leader, is to have the backs of the people who work for me. And if they failed for the right reasons, to encourage them to do it again. I'll never forget that I, I screwed up on something one time. Mike called me on my cell phone. And I didn't get a lot of calls from him on my cell phone, so I was nervous. Mm -hmm. um, he asked me like three questions about what had happened. He got comfortable that. I was trying to do the right thing, and I took the risk into it. He said, do it again. Do it again. And you all have a responsibility in this, because it's always easier to cover the thing that went wrong. It's so hard to get a story about something that went right. And so the question is, you know, I'm glad, sorry, Scott, in the age of Trump, that you all are out there doing that and covering the things that are going wrong. Because you create accountability in a way that we all need when we sit on my side of the table. But you also got to figure out how to tell a story that isn't as exciting, that's hard in a way that gets people's attention. Because part of what's contributed to the lack of faith in government is that it's too easy to write the story about what's going wrong. And it's too hard to write the story about what's working. So that, that's one. Um, for Barack Obama, you know, they always said, no drama, Obama. It is, it's exactly right. And it is really, really hard in the public sector, for some of the reasons I just talked about, to take the long view 
And Barack Obama always took the long view. He was always willing to take some short-term political pain. And this goes to the, like, the stuff we were doing in housing. He was always saying, you know, like, I'm, I'm willing to get yelled at by Rick Santelli or whoever it is for doing the right thing. Um, and was, was stable through those, those tough pieces. The other thing I would say I learned from both of them, and I think it's instructive in what we're going through right now, is nobody, nobody can manage an entire city. Nobody can manage an entire country. I, my, my sense is that the best, any, like the best manager can do is manage maybe 15 people. And so the most important decision you make as a leader is who you pick for your team, period. And if you make good choices, and then to go back to the point I made about Mike Bloomberg, if you trust them, if you're willing to let them fail, and you're willing to have their back when they take risks for the right reasons, and try new things, and try to innovate, um, that's how you get things done in government. And that's not the perception most people have of leadership. Um, they tend to personalize it in you know, individual heroic figures. But that's not the way, that's not the way organizations work, and it's certainly not the way government works. Well, thank you for interrupting your vacation <laughs> to, um, to be with us today. And uh, when you're ready to really get back to work, we hope you, we hope you come back. Back thank on. You.